Okay. Well, here we are on Laodicea night, the seventh church, and um, I was always fascinated with this church of Laodicea. In fact, when I was in seminary, I preached my senior sermon on Laodicea, <clears throat> and uh, I also, uh, I grew up in a certain Southern Baptist church in Austin, Texas, and the guy let me come back and preach once. Uh, and I preached on Laodicea as well. <laughs> and uh, because I believed back then that this was the seven movements of church history and therefore we're in the Laodicean era, you see. So uh, I believed that uh, the when you look back, people started observing this in the 1700s that uh, the seven churches reflect the progress of church history. And so this is not a, this would be a secondary interpretation of it, a typological interpretation, but not a primary interpretation. So the, I haven't stressed that, even though I kind of like that view, but I don't know. And as my church history professor used to say, if you read enough church history, you can prove anything from history. And uh, therefore, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to emphasize that. But uh, this, is, this is a church that I've always been interested for the reasons, as I said. Now, in our study of the book of Revelation, we're seeing that it's divided into three major sections. The first section is Christ in his resurrected form in chapter 1. And then the second section is chapters 2 and 3 which are seven epistles um, that are unique in all of uh, history. You have many examples of extra biblical books where they try to imitate the Bible, but there's not one example of any literature that we're aware of that try to replicate the seven churches as seven epistles type thing. It's totally unique and it's put into the book of Revelation. So, when you think about it, there's seven new epistles, if you will, uh, that we tend not to think about, that give us information about, uh, you know, God's plan for history, God's plan for these churches, et cetera. And so we see that if this does refer to the seven movements of church history, in addition to referring to the seven churches that they're speaking to, uh, then Laodicea would be the last age, and that would probably be the age that we're in. <laughs> uh, because Christendom is the largest religion in the world. It's got a half a billion more people than Islam. Don't let them tell you that Islam is the largest religion in the world. It's not. Christendom, that is, Christendom is the term that refers to anything related to Christianity. So Catholics and, and Greek Orthodox and everybody would be included in that. And it is still the largest religion in the world. Now, Bible-believing evangelicals, we're lucky to have maybe 10% at the most of Christendom, you see, of real believers. But that is not surprising when you read about the Church of Laodicea. And so we especially are looking for Christ's return. And these are the seven churches of Asia. Asia is what we call Turkey today. In Western Turkey, I have been to Ephesus is the only one of these I've been to. Uh, but you see the, this was a postal cycle back in the day. And uh, the last one was Laodicea. And it is not far from Philadelphia or Colossae. It's only seven miles from Colossae where Paul wrote uh, the book of Colossians to similar people. And there were three cities there in that like, what's called the Lycus Valley. And as we're going to see, this was a very uh, big earthquake area, still is. Turkey has a lot of earthquakes uh, even today. And so this is the church that Jesus couldn't join, apparently. He's standing at the door outside of the church knocking. And so here is some pictures of it. And we see that 
uh, it was a very fertile, wealthy place. It was tremendously wealthy. And uh, we see that the city of Laodicea was located in a fertile valley overlooking the Lycus River, about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. Six miles north uh, stood the ancient Heriopolis, the holy city or city of the sanctuary. Heriopolis is famous in Greek literature, etc. And 10 miles to the east was Colossae. So these cities formed a tri-city area of the Lycus Valley, Lycus River, and they are clearly associated with each other in the New Testament. And you read about these other places. Colossians mentions Laodicea, for example, in the book of Colossians. And Laodicea was the most southerly of the seven churches and was almost due east from Ephesus. Laodicea occupied a critical juncture on the major highway that ran from Ephesus in the west to Phrygia in the east, and also the road from Pergamum and Sardis crossed this east-west route into Laodicea. And it was definitely the hub, the judicial uh, seat of the district. And it was established by Antiochus II and named, and that was around uh, the 260s, and named in honor of his wife, Le Laodice, lay dice. It's the word, see the word Laodicea. Uh, Laos is the Greek word we get our word layman from, people. Laodicea means uh, the rule or judgment of the people. And that's not good uh, because their people rule, Laodicea in church was people ruled rather than biblically ruled. And I don't want to get into elder rule and all that kind of stuff, but it is interesting. The first time in all the history of the church that we ever have, I grew up Southern Baptist, and uh, this was early on an issue for me, uh, not later though. Uh, the only time you ever have a, a church congregation that votes on things is in, in the United States in the early 1800s. Now, if you parallel that with American history, that was the rise of what we call Jacksonian democracy. And so the Southern Baptists and other Baptists were the first to have people voting on things rather than having elder rule, where mature elders supposedly, theoretically, uh, made decisions for things. And uh, so that's another focus on people rule, if you will. And the city was famous for three things. First, it was the financial or banking center of the area. Uh, when Cicero was traveling east in 51 BC, he cast his letters of credit in Laodicea. Secondly, Laodicea was the seat of a famous medical center. During the first century AD, there were a, was a temple uh, that was 12 miles northwest of Laodicea that served as a medical school. They blended religion and all of that kind of stuff, you see. And uh, therefore, it had a medical school there in Laodicea, and it was famous for ISAV and helping people with see, uh, sight problems. And um, thirdly, it was an important hub of industry, especially the cloth and clothing industry. So the local factories were famous for weaving expensive garments uh, out of the valuable glossy black soft wool from the local sheep. And uh, Strabo, who was a, a Roman historian, comments on this aspect of Laodicea. He says, the country around Laodicea produces sheep that are excellent, not only for the softness of their wool, in which uh, they surpass even the um, Milistine wool, but also for their raven black color so that the Laodiceans derive splendid revenue from it, as do also their neighboring Colossi from the colors which bear the same name. So it was like the Bank of America back in the day, as they say. Uh, it was like Macy's and the Mayo Clinic all rolled into one. It was a thriving, prosperous city in the first century. In spite of all the advantages of living in Laodicea, there were two major drawbacks to living in the city. First was its propensity for earthquakes. How many of you would like to live in an earthquake-prone area? 
how many have lived in California? <laughs> I lived there. I've lived there for a year once. And, uh, <clears throat> and it was when I was in, um, in Virginia, though, in Lynchburg, Virginia, that I felt an earthquake go through there. And it was like a train coming and it went, you could feel it going past. And by the time it hit, hit Lynchburg, it was not very bad, but where it first struck, it was really bad. So uh, it had a, and Strabo says that Lycus flows underground for the most part. And then the Lycus river flowed underground for the most part. And then after emerging to the surface unites with other rivers, thus indicating that the country is full of holes and subject to earthquakes. For if any other country is subject to earthquakes, Laodicea is. And uh, it was devastated by an earthquake in AD 17 during the time of Christ's early life. And again in AD 60, a major earthquake. In the aftermath of the first earthquake in AD 17, uh, the Laodiceans, the Sardians, and the Philadelphians all accepted aid from Tiberius to help rebuild their cities. However, in AD 60, Laodicea refused all aid and assistance, preferring to rebuild its devastated city from its own resources. Laodicea was too rich to need help from anyone. Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us that in the same year, Laodicea, one of the famous Asiatic cities, was laid in ruins by an earthquake, but recovered by its own resources without assistance from ourselves. Talking about the Romans there. So that shows you how wealthy they were. And this is an important argument for the date of the book of Revelation. When we started, we talked about that and about how this was important because uh, preterists, people who believe the book of Revelation has already happened in the first century, uh, have to go with the AD 65 date. But uh, if Laodicea had an earthquake in AD 60, and yet it's described as being rich and wealthy and in need of nothing, then that doesn't support an AD 65 date for the book of Revelation because they were still in a major building rebuilding campaign. And so that, that is an argument for the AD 95 date, which we believe is the correct date for the writing of the book of Revelation. And that renders the preterist interpretation uh, impossible. And uh, another drawback was its water supplies, we'll see tonight. The city lacked a natural water supply and had to obtain its water from a source uh, to the south. And today one can still see the remains of an aqueduct coming from the south into the city of Laodicea. And um, so that was five miles away and uh, it was it, uh, the natural water in Laodicea was full of minerals and stuff. And the water that came in, it started out at about 95 degrees, it was hot. And that was a big resort area in that other city where the water originated. But by the time it got to um, Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And it was viewed as not something that you'd wanna drink. And that's the, we're gonna say it's connected to the idea of spewing it out of your mouth type thing here in the book of Laodicea. Um, so with that as a background, we see that the church means people judge or people rule is what the word Laodicea means. It's viewed as the lukewarm or the apostate church. And so it's interesting how the New Testament defines what we call apostasy as being lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, you see. And it, it would be historically from about 1900 to the present day. Uh, and it would be, if that seven movements of church history is correct, it's the last church uh, in the church age. So the commission is to the church of Laodicea, the character Christ describes himself as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And 
there's no commendation. This is one of the two churches where he doesn't say anything good about them. Remember, there's two churches he doesn't say anything bad about as well. One was last time, uh, the Church of Philadelphia. And my dad used to say, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. Well, <laughs> uh, God doesn't always follow that principle. <clears throat> and you have a condemnation, pretty long one. They're lukewarm. You say that they're, they say, I'm rich and wealthy. But in, in reality, they have nothing spiritually he's talking about. Really naked and blind, even though they had this wonderful uh, clothing and things, you see. And so the correction is be zealous. In other words, get hot <laughs> and repent. And the call is an invitation to the ma a marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what Revelation 3.20 is all about. We'll get there and do a lot with that. It's a famous verse that me, having been on staff with Campus Crusade for two years, uh, that was their gospel verse that invited Christ people to trust Christ with. And so, whoops. So, whoops, I messed up. And so the challenge, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says through the church. It's the same challenge that we have at the end of each one of them. So as we looked at the historical background, there's an example of the aqueduct that ran the water supply uh, from five miles away to Laodicea. And you could see how the pipes, these are ancient pipes, would get clogged up with that salty guck in them. And they, in fact, each section in the, this aqueduct, they made it where they could uh, check if the clog was in that section. They could uh, kind of disassemble it and clean it out and keep it going. And here's a that's the city or town, a place where the water originally comes from. So it's from a very salty area. And there is what's some of what's left of Laodicea today. There's a modern city that has overtaken most of Laodicea today in Turkey. And so we see in verse 14, to the angel of the church of Laodicea write the amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. And we've shown that God, uh, Christ addresses each person with the, uh, from the composite of his, the description of him from chapter 1. And last week we saw one example, the only example where he described Christ as not using some of those last week, last time. Uh, some of those from chapter 1. And so you see the composite of chapter 1 of describing the risen, resurrected, and glorified Christ, and elements from chapter 1 are taken and applied to each church in conjunction with their need or the criticism or the um, compliments that Christ gives. And so they're the amen, the faithful and true. Now, uh, if you look in Colossians chapter 1, you see in verse 15 some connection here between the description of Christ here and what we see in Colossians 1. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, and so the beginning of the creation of God says this, and that's a very similar thing talking about Christ. And uh, he says, for by him, all things were created in verse 16 of Colossians 1, both in the heavens and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ holds the universe together, all things. And he is also head of the body, the church. 
and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of, to dwell in him. In other words, he was fully God. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. And I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away uh, from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven in which I, Paul, was made a minister. So the hope here is a reference to the future that God has planned for us. And so this is who is addressing uh, the Colossians. The amen and faithful means that his word is true. So he's going to give a true word to these people who have gone astray in the Laodicean church. And his witness, his testimony about them is true as well. And his criticism is certainly correct. And uh, because he's the beginning of creation of all things, then he knows where uh, what the way things are supposed to be. And then he says in verse 15, I know your deeds. There's, he's, he's calculated their deeds that you are neither hot, cold, nor hot. And I would that you were cold or hot. Why? Well, it's believed that if it's cold, then it's useful. And um, further down the stream, the water, uh, I think like seven or eight miles further down, it was cold. It was cold water and it was very uh, considered very good tasting water. Hot, as I say, when it comes out of its source, it's like 95 degrees even to this day, and uh, you can do something with hot stuff. But cold uh, or, or lukewarm, as it's presented here, is something that is spewed out of the mouth, and that's kind of like a vomit or a reaction to uh, what's going on there. And so, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you, and that's the word vomit, you out of my mouth. Have you ever had something that you drank or swallowed that causes you to vomit or near? I have <laughs> as well. And it's just an instant reaction of your body to whatever it is, whatever the source of that item is. And so um, I have a friend in seminary call this the last vomit of Satan, Laodicea, you know, and stuff like that. There's all kinds of little ditties like that that people have made up about it but he's saying they're repulsive to christ the church is repulsive because apparently when you're in that middle ground you're either hot or cold you can't do anything and you know a lot of people live their christian life that way kind of in that middle ground they're they're not really engaged or disengaged they're just kind of floating along there. And he says, because you say I am rich. Now, this is, this is what they think. After all, we, we rebuilt our own town by ourselves during a 30-year process, you see. Uh, and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And, of course, it makes you think of the emperor who had no clothes on or something like that, you know, walking down the street thinking, you know, and everybody's laughing at him uh, because they see reality. But he had been taught or convinced that he had this wonderful clothing on, which he didn't, of course. And so uh, they thought that they were rich because of material goods. And does that not describe our church today? I think it was back in the 50s, Billy Graham said, if the Holy Spirit left, most churches would go on as normal, would never notice it. And uh, that's kind of the thing. It's our, uh, 
wealth, our programs, all of these kinds of things, and no reliance upon God, upon God, the Holy Spirit, to do what he does. Uh, if we don't have enough people, then we get some kind of humanistic campaign to go out and get more people into the church. You see, uh, uh, it's called church growth. <laughs> and we're surrounded by those kind of churches here. And what's interesting is during this COVID time, guess who's not going to church? The church growth people. They're afraid. They're staying at home. Guess what churches are growing by leaps and bounds? Many, many of the churches that stand up for the word of God. I know uh, John MacArthur's church, a lot of Calvary Chapel churches are growing because in California, they stayed open regardless of what the government told them. And then finally, a judge came along and told the government, you, you, you can't do that anymore. And uh, I think they pretty much won the victory there. And so he's saying that if you think of yourself as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, what are you going to do? You're going to look for some help, right? You, you realize you're in a state of need, and you need the grace of God. And he's saying uh, they were deceived in the opposite way. And then in verse 18, he says, I advise you to buy from me, from me gold refined by fire. Now, what do, you, what do you think that means? Gold refined by fire. In other words, trials and tribulations that the average Christian goes through, which results when you uh, have the right reaction and service of the Lord, then that's like gold, silver, precious stones, right? Laid up in heaven. And that you may become rich in spiritually, and white garments, uh, they're known for their black garments, but you would receive white garments, and that is always pictured in the Bible as a believer's covering. You see it at, at, in Revelation chapter 19 when the believers uh, dressed in white garments return with Christ uh, at the second coming, that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And he's talking, obviously, about spiritual nakedness. And, uh, you know, what's the saying? You got to get lost before you can get saved. And the problem with a lot of people is they don't ever get lost, do they? They don't realize their need, their, that they're sinners. And he says, and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. And that's, that's the whole problem is they were famous for this famous eye salve but they couldn't see spiritually the condition that they were in. And so one has to first realize the condition they're in. And he says, those whom I love, I reprove in this one. So here he's saying, I think he loves them. And I think these very well could be believers. People debate back and forth. Is he talking about people, a church full of unbelievers, or is he talking to believers? Well, I think he's probably talking to believers here. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. And uh, that's the whole point, is that you discipline a child because you love them. Because you know if they're not disciplined, if they uh, uh, follow after their own lusts or desires uh, because of our fallen nature, then they, they will end up in a bad way. They will end up moving away from the Lord, not following authority, etc., and so that's why uh, we discipline our children and we, because we love them. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Repent means to do a 180. And so if he's talking to believers here, then uh, they need to get with it and become hot, I guess you would say, <laughs> instead of uh, lukewarm. And Here's the famous verse, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and, I, and will dine with him and he with me. Now, is this a salvation verse? I don't think so. It's a, it's a, a call to fellowship. And, you know, some of you may have gotten saved through this verse. I don't know. I've 
I led people to Christ when I was with Campus Crusade <laughs> first, and uh, God uses it. But I, uh, upon further study, in fact, my uh, second year on uh, staff with Crusade, I was at the University of Buffalo in New York for a year, and we had a student who was a Russian major from New York City, and uh, he knew was learning languages, and he brought this up to to me and said, this is improper to use as an evangelism verse. And this student had figured this out all on his own, who was not a Bible major or anything like that. And uh, because he uh, had a focus on the grammar and everything. So here's the four spiritual laws. And there's many other examples that we could cite, but this is my background here, you know, four spiritual laws, Campus Crusade. And I, by the way, I loved Campus Crusade. It was great. We were winning people to Christ by the car loads back in the 70s. And only later did we realize there was a revival going on. But nevertheless, uh, a lot of people got saved, especially on college campuses through Campus Crusade for Christ. And uh, they said, we receive Christ through personal invitation. Christ speaking says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And then look what they say, commentary. Receiving Christ involves turning to God from self, repentance, and trusting Christ to come into, single word, our lives to forgive our sin and to make us what he wants us to be. And so you see how they quoted the scripture verse correctly. You have two words, in, space, to. And then they changed the meaning in the commentary with a single word. So what this is saying is that Christ will come in the room up to you. See, the grammar and the, the, the word does not mean that Christ will come into your life. You see what I'm saying? But that's how they uh, took it. And, uh, you know, that's just a wrong view there. Whoops, forgot I had those things underlined there. And so here's a preposition chart. How many of y'all have ever seen a, a Greek preposition chart before? <laughs> yeah. and, and prepositions give direction to language. And if this were talking about Christ coming into your life, it would be the preposition ice, E-I-S. That's pronounced ice. And it means into, to be outside of the sphere, for example, outside the building, you walk through the door, you've come into the sphere of this building, you see. And, uh, but the Greek preposition pros is used, not ice. Pros means I will come up to you. And uh, uh, in the genitive case, it means that. And so, as we said, whoops, let me go back here. Uh, yeah, in, in the accusative case, rather. When pros is used in combination with the accusative case, it means to be at, near, or by. In the dative case, it means to, among, or toward. So it's in the accusative case here. And Greek is an inflected language, has endings, you see, that we don't like Spanish does, same thing. Most languages do, English does not. Uh, and Danker's lexicon, you know, BDAG, whatever you want to call it, is the standard le Greek lexicon that virtually everybody uses. And uh, the NIV translates it, I will come in and eat with you. And that's the idea. He's going to come into the room and eat with you. So what's the picture? Christ is where? He's outside the church. And he's knocking. And he wants to come into the church and have fellowship. But because of what he's described in the previous verses, they're out of fellowship with him. The Darby translation which the New American Standard that I use was derivative two translations back from the Darby translation. 
says, behold, I send the door knock and am knocking. So he's trying to get the, the tents there. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in unto him. So that, that's better, in unto him. And sup with him and he with me. And so you're, you're, I'm sure you've gotten the message by now that uh, nowhere does the Bible teach you to invite Christ into your life. Now, people say, well, it's so easy for children to understand and use it as a child. Well, it, no, it's not. D believe. The Gospel of John, is it 97 times or something like that, says believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Romans book of Romans says, and the book of Romans also uses the word believe, and that's the one that explains the gospel most in depth. And so the gospel is something you believe, you trust in. You, uh, you are convinced that it's true, and you come to believe in it. How many of y'all believe the Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl this year? Nobody. Oh, well, there's a reluctant hand. I was going to give an altar call here for <laughs> all of those. But uh, that's something you don't know if it's going to happen. At this point, it looks, even though they lost tonight, I assume, they were down because they didn't play their first string guys, you know. Uh, even though they, they're probably the best team in the NFL, doesn't mean that they'll necessarily win. So it's not the same kind of belief or trust. You know, you, it's more of a want, right? You desire it, assuming that most people here are Chiefs fans. I grew up a Dallas Cowboy fan, but that's beside the point. <clears throat> By the way, before they were the Kansas City Chiefs, who were they? The Dallas Texans. They moved from Dallas to Kansas City after three years. In Dallas, they couldn't compete with the Cowboys, so they came to Kansas City. Well, they couldn't, you know, the NFL teams. <laughs> uh, but I better, I've gone to meddling, as they say, you know, I better move on. Let's get back to our prepositions here. <laughs> so ice means he will come come into, and that's not what's used, it's pros, up to. So all, uh, here's another point. Although the distinctions are not uniformly maintained, it is generally true that with regard to literal movement, ice denotes entry into and pros approach up to. And correspondingly, that ice is used with the impersonal objects and pros with the personal objects. That's another point there and of course Christ coming into uh, up to that person is a personal situation as well and so uh, we had a professor at Dallas Mike Kokoris who was into evangelism and he gave a whole hour and 10 minute lecture on this uh, and he was very zealous about not using that and my back in the Mid 70s, when I attended seminary, we were full of former campus crusaders and uh, all of that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> we see in verse 20, uh, 21, it says, He who overcomes. And so they talk about the overcomer everywhere. And we've shown repeatedly that an overcomer is a believer in John's writing. We see uh, it says in 1 John, He that overcomes comes is he who believes and so if you believe that Jesus you know and accept Christ as your savior you're an overcomer why because Christ has done everything for you he's put you in a position uh, for that over but there are people out there who want to say that there are two types of believers some believers who are overcomers and some who aren't and some have even gone so far as to say that so, uh, some believers will basically go to a, a purgatory uh, during the millennium. They won't get to go into the millennium and stuff. How they come up with that stuff, I mean, I see how they come up with it, but it's just crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, as if 
through my works, I receive anything of eternal benefit. It's only through the work of Christ. Yes, he wants me to serve him and live for him. And, and he does give us rewards. That's a whole other thing. And possibly one status in the millennium, possibly. But the idea that some are not going to be overcomers who believe, who are genuine believing Christians is, is not true. But so he's talking to believers here. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Co-rulership. Isn't that great? Jesus, where is he? Well, right now he's at the right hand of the Father. Where is he going to be in the millennium? sitting on David's throne. See, he, he will literally be sitting on a throne in Jerusalem in the new temple, in that millennial temple. And you could literally go there, meet him and shake his hand, so to speak, during that time. And so we're going to, as a church, as believers, we're going to uh, sit down with me. He doesn't say on my throne, but you're going to be with him. Why are we with him? Because we're his bride. The bride. And I know that it's a little hard for some of us guys to take, but nevertheless, that is a feminine concept. Christ is the actor, and we're the acted upon. That's the idea of masculinity and femininity often in the scriptures. And so as the bride... We uh, are there because of the benefit of what, the, what Christ has done. As I also overcome, came and sat down with my father on his throne. And so Christ earned this benefit. And if, as you, as a believer, you can receive the similar benefit. So some solutions to Laodicea's problem is number one, be zealous and repent against spiritual compromise, against spiritual compromise. Number two, buy from me gold refined by fire because of spiritual poverty. You see the connections here. Three, buy from me white garments for spiritual nakedness. Thing is, you can't buy those garments. <laughs> But he's uh, saying that they felt they didn't have any needs. Buy from me ISAV for spiritual blindness and open the door for Christlessness. In other words, uh, trust Christ as your Savior and have fellowship with him. And by, by the way, that is an invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb, Revelation 3.20 to sit down with him, and it's referring, I think, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's an invitation of fellowship with him, and uh, that is exactly what we're going to experience. In fact, when does the bride of Christ get married? Does anybody know in the book of Revelation? At what point in God's plan for history? Before the supper, where? In heaven, right? But when does the supper take place? The marriage supper of the Lamb. A lot of people think it takes place in heaven. No, it does not. It takes place at the beginning of the millennium. So we're married, to use that imagery, in heaven. We return with him. And then after 75 days of cleansing, the millennium starts, and it starts with a banquet to celebrate the marriage of the Lamb, and it's going to last a long time. And all of the friends of the bridegroom are invited from all of history, all the way back to Adam and Eve, all the way through uh, to millennial saints. We're going to have that marriage supper of the Lamb uh, after the second coming. But the marriage takes place in heaven. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The same exact phrase, as we said, it ends all seven uh, epistles to the churches. Same exact in the Greek, no changes whatsoever. And so he shifts to the individual where uh, he's calling to the individual here. But we see in summary the condition of the church in Laodicea is poor, blind, naked, but especially lukewarm, wretched, miserable. And because of its prophetic condition of self-reliance, the church in Laodicea had nothing good to offer. So I uh, read an article a while back on the young atheists. Are you all familiar? You know, there's a movement in the last 10 years among young people becoming atheists. And uh, one of the churches I pastored in Austin, Texas, for almost 10 years, had a kid that grew up in our church. When I left, he was only like seven or eight years old, but he is a young atheist. And my youngest son and him email back and forth, you know, a lot and everything. And uh, supposedly this is kind of a fad to, to be an atheist, you know, and to talk about how, uh, you know, you don't believe in God, et cetera. And they've got all kinds of things on the internet where they say that. And a survey was done a few years ago. Most grew up in church. And I can see going to these church growth churches, how, you know, you, you don't learn hardly anything at those things. You just have a good time, supposedly. The mission and message of their churches was vague. You know, they changed the nomenclature from unbeliever and believer to seeker, a seeker, as if the unbelievers are all seeking after God. No man seeketh after God, the scripture says. No, not one. So they, they, they changed all the vocabulary in these seeker churches, you see. Thirdly, they felt their church offered superficial answers to life's difficult questions. See, you can see what the Laodicean church produces, right? Unbeliever, a bunch of, uh, not that everybody in these church growth churches, for example, are, uh, you know, are unbelievers or not, but this is what they tend to produce. They felt their church's official superficial answers to life's difficult questions. They expressed their respect for those ministers who took the Bible seriously, interestingly enough. They respected them, even though they didn't agree with them. And they saw a difference in that. And most became atheists by ages 14 to 17. Well, you really know a lot when you're 14, don't you? But that's the spirit of the age. And the decision to embrace unbelief was often an emotional one. Just, just like for some people coming to Christ is an emotional one. I mean, there, there may be emotions attached, but it's not necessarily an emotional thing. It is when you realize the importance of it, you know. And the, the Internet factored heavily into their conversion to atheism. And so th this is an example of the kind of stuff that we see in a, in a Laodicean age where apparently we're living during that time. We're seeing the decline of evangelical Christianity. And, uh, but all is not gone. There's still many millions and millions of very strong, true believers. It's just that Christianity reached its peak in America in the modern times uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And uh, there, there was a revival, and uh, I majored in historical history or historical theology or church history at Dallas Seminary, and our professor used to say it takes 40 years to evaluate a time period. And about five years ago, 
a book came out, Oxford Press, on the history of the Jesus movement called God's Forever Family. And it said that uh, some guy had done a, a, a survey over the years in, in North America, including Canada, of basically 30% of North American hippies got saved during that seven year period from 1968 to 1975. And that gave America a reprieve. We were headed down the, the gutter politically and socially, but I believe that revival, which I also took a course, history of revivalism in America. And we have had a revival every generation, meaning every 40, at least every 40 years from, seven, from 1607 to modern times. And now for the first time since the Jesus movement, we've gone without a revival for the first time in the history of America uh, in the last 45 years. And uh, so that's why you see a tremendous decline numerically and, and things. And you see a lot of churches trying to do other things to attract a crowd rather than giving them uh, the, the word of God and the, and the good gospel and everything. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're still at work, that you are calling people to faith in Jesus Christ. You haven't come to rapture the church or take us to be with you yet. And so even though there are ups and downs in the time in which we live, this is not new. Uh, this is common for the church. And we just pray that uh, you would uh, motivate us to live even more strongly for you in these days ahead. In Christ's name, amen.